GTO was a tricky series for me to get myself wrapped into. When I attempted my first watch, I couldn't find any interest with it whatsoever. However, after many more years of having watched many anime series, I found myself craving for something different from your stereotypical shonen anime, as I felt like trying a slice of life series. As most of those type of series often get overlooked by most anime fans that just stick to series that are currently trending just to play it safe. Even though the story for GTO doesn't particularly tug on most people's interest for your need to watch it, what really drives this series through is how Onizuka approaches each problem student as a challenge to resolve their issues, which I suppose is where the battle element comes in, as his class is labelled as the worst class in the whole entirety of the school, therefore creating this opportunity of a challenge for a 22 year old pervert adolescent teenage delinquent to overcome and obtain trust from all his students that have driven away every new teacher that they get out of the school. You may be thinking that the show may all be just shits and giggles, especially with the countless hilarious expressions that Onizuka portrays himself. However, that is not all there is to GTO, because when shit gets real, Onizuka always comes up with the right shit to act on and say. Given this abnormal behaviour of a teacher, it makes Onizuka all the more of an intriguing shonen protagonist, making him the great teacher Onizuka. Nine. I was reluctant to try Hitman Reborn at first sight. Even from my perception of seeing a kid with his hair lit on fire right beside a baby in a suit, I just couldn't take this shit seriously. So one day I was very ill and when you're ill, you know the only cure is to watch Animu slash bed rest or a wank or two. That's besides the point. So I laid down and marathoned a good 100 or so episodes whilst feeling like I was on the verge of my death on my bed. Then when I stumbled across a massive time skip and I'm like, dude, shit has gotten real. Then I found myself a little more drawn to the plot as the characters chemistry and interactions was what drove the show forward for me at the start for me personally. At the time I did check out Hitman Reborn, I didn't really watch any shows that had as many likeable characters as Hitman Reborn did. Therefore it was cool to see a protagonist that started off as an actual loser that I could relate to with no charm, muscle, confidence nor intelligence to turn into somewhat of a kick-ass protagonist as the series progressed. Sadly with Hitman Reborn the anime met its doom around 2010 and with the manga ending shortly afterwards around last year if you haven't seen the series whatsoever then do check it out legally on Crunchyroll. Eight. The world God Only Knows is very unique to the shonen genre. It presents something vastly different to what most shonens offer. With the world God Only Knows, we have an antisocial high school teenager who would rather spend his time conquering 2D girls in these dating sim games right as his fingertips of his PFP. So yes, it, it has games. Get the fuck used to it. So already we have an unusual protagonist at the ready that doesn't really have anything going for him. So when it comes to being forced to participating in conquering girls in real life, it comes to as a surprise on how Kamer, the main protagonist, executes each conqueror for a girl, which is where the shonen element comes in with the battle to open up the girl's heart with love, to unleash a demon soul. Seeing Kamer, an antisocial god of the gaming world that detests the reality much like myself, conquering real girls with the skills he picked up from dating sims, this opened up new interesting elements within each girl he conquered, as well as his personality makes it harder to believe how he manages to make a variety types of different girls fall head over heels for him as each girl brings in more different yet interesting obstacles. Then just as things start to get stale, the show takes a complete 180 and shit gets serious around season 3 of the anime. So it's definitely worth checking out LEGALLY on Crunchyroll. Seven. As I had never watched a sports anime nor much sport at all, it came as quite a shock to me that this one particular anime resonated with my love for shonen. Like many people who prejudge anime based on what they see based on an effing picture. My expectations was pretty low when I was checking out the series, but when it came to the matches, the shonen element to the show really caught my interest, with each special ability that each player from the generation of miracles was able to use in matches, which is where the supernatural shonen shit kicks in. This range 
changed from being able to copy one style to being able to make a basket from more or less anywhere on the court. Most people naturally make the assumption that in order to enjoy a sports anime or manga, you must have some interest or have played a sport to enjoy it. Whereas I feel that's bull crap with Kuroko no Basket. There is no need to have an interest as the story and characters is simple and somewhat interesting enough to draw your attachment to the obstacles that the main characters Kagami and Kuroko face in order to achieve their goal of surpassing Team Generation, the very team that defined the word miracle. Also, if you adore Togashi's work, then you owe it to him to try out Kuroko's basketball as he was the editor for the manga. Well, to be honest, Togashi is the one that really owes it to us to finish Hiatus Cross Hiatus. Six. As generic as Jojo seems to be, using the most common traits that we often see from other shonens, somehow Jojo just makes it work with his unbelievable fast pacing and development in the first three episodes. But the one major reason why I find Jojo unique from the rest is how we get fresh restart after each member of the Jojo bloodline has finished their story. We get a brand new story of the next generation of the Jojo bloodline instead of dragging on the one story for the entirety of the series. I feel like this formula particularly keeps keeps the story from going stale, whilst still carrying over leftovers from previous parts, like in Jojo Part 1 where they transitioned characters from there into Part 2 as a continuation. Therefore, ensuring there's a balance of it not completely changing the story, whilst bringing in some of the old and mixing it with the new, or transforming some of the old and turning it into the new, as each part gets better and better with no signs of slowing down. And if you're going to give me the whole, EW IT LOOKS SO GAY! Oh, SAVE ME! Then go and crawl back to your so-called manly show, Black Butler. Thank you. Five. Then we got Hunter x Hunter, the remake of the infamous Hiatus Cross Hiatus that most people refer to it as. Since it's a well most known trait left by Togashi, as he always takes a yearly break when he catches a slight freaking hiccup, which seems to be every day of his life, as he is currently still on his mighty long ass hiatus. So you may be asking why Hunter x Hunter has made it on this list. Just because Togashi is on holly- <coughs> I mean, sick doesn't mean the content of Hunter x Hunter is just as bad as his health. Hunter x Hunter may have a childish cliche looking exterior, however do not underestimate how dark and batshit insane the story gets. Heck, that itself is an understatement to the show. The variety we get from the story in Hunter x Hunter ranges from virtual realities that look very much like a crossover with Sword Art Online and Yu-Gi-Oh, and dark gritty allies of York Shin that you wouldn't want to run into in a dark alley and approach, and currently one of the darkest arcs I've seen from a shounen, the Chimera ant arc, where death unexpectedly springs in from left and right, however after witnessing the awesomeness of Karapika he bids farewell for the next 35 episodes and counting, never to be seen till a flashback of him playing baseball with Leorio. But don't get me wrong, as the development and friendship between Gon and Killua starts to deepen, the more yaoi fictions that start to write itself, so make sure to check out Hunter x Hunter LEGALLY on Crunchyroll. Four. I apologise for being a little generic here with my choice, I just can't help it and turn away from an iconic childhood show of mine. So I guess most of you must be wondering why the duck is this motherfucker choosing Dragon Ball Kai over Dragon Ball Z? Well the reason for that is of course due to the cuts off all the filler. Now don't get me wrong as I did enjoy some of Dragon Ball Z filler, however what was different from Kai was of course the pacing and kept everything that was relevant without unnecessarily dragging anything longer than it needed to be shown for, i.e. the screaming matches, I wanted to consume the main meat of the story of Dragon Ball Z and Kai was the answer, as I was easily able to marathon through the series pretty quickly and some of the arcs that I felt dragged out in Dragon Ball Z, especially the Namek Saga, was executed a lot better in Dragon Ball Kai in my opinion. Before deciding to watch Dragon Ball Kai after having not seen it since I was a kid learning my times tables, I had my doubts on whether my enjoyment for Dragon Ball Z would perish after watching over a hundred series of anime. So after having Having watched an episode or two, I was hooked in watching the rest of the part. Reason being, I think for m the most of it, certain things I didn't question as a kid certainly made a lot more sense when I was watching Dragon Ball Kai the second time round. The only thing that agitated me most was that Toy Animation could have taken advantage of this opportunity to reanimate the whole series and given how popular Dragon Ball Z is across the world and in Japan, this wouldn't have been much of a risk nor strain on Toei's pockets. Three. 
up for that. As for Bakuman, it had that unique factor of being a one-in-a-kind anime and manga series for what it was, as a story about the journey to being a manga had never been touched on before. This seemed to be a promising premise with no way of fucking up the plot. I found this anime to be the most informative out of all the other series I have seen, which is why I feel that Bakuman has engraved itself into my memory. It taught me about most of the things, if not the main gist of what goes down in the reality behind the scenes of a shonen magazine. Then to see how a manga could develop his skills from the ground up, overcoming many obstacles really does draw you into feeling attached to Ashirogi and their allies that they compete with. So after watching Bakuman, it really does make you appreciate the chapters that you get every week to some extent. Whatever you do, don't even think of trying the English dub. Seriously, you won't see Mashirio and Tagaki the same way ever again. True. The show really sticks it to most shonen's that if you plan everything for how the story will go from point A to point B, then everything will flow together nicely without any slight hesitation in the story. And by that, I mean fudging fillers. The story doesn't feel either too short or too long without the story feeling stretched and has the essence of the plot feeling very original. Seeing Edward and Alphonse running into the several dead ends whilst losing no hope in regaining their bodies back can't just help but root for them, which makes them much more likeable as main characters, especially how the story doesn't revolve around them needing to get stronger and powerful to triumph in any one they come across. As this is what most shonens tend to rely on most to develop the engagement between the viewer and reader. Then we also get to see other characters take Shining 2 in the spotlight, which shows how none of the supporting and side characters get overshadowed by the Elric brothers, and how the side characters can kick ass whilst keeping that epic flow going. Overall, Full Metal Alchemist overwhelmed me on everything from a touching an intense in-depth plot to great likeable characters you gave a damn about in the end as well as that orgasmic soundtrack that resonates with the downtimes and the uptimes of the show. The animation itself is outdone by the works of Bones. The enjoyment you get from the comedy to take the edge off or the serious tension. Overall it's a great all-rounder shonen that many should learn from and take influence off of. One. This show really opened up my mind on how I perceived the importance of characters within a series. Even though all the characters have their flaws and slight imperfections as functional human beings, it's what brings all these characters together to balance out those flaws which is frankly quite touching and saves the show from going on yet another training arc to conquer the one enemy like most other shonen. Even within the show, the whole cast is considered to make up the whole concept of the main character, not just solely focused on one or two people, which is why it's easy for a series like Gintama to pull off these standalone episodic arcs, like the ones you see from shows like Cowboy Beat Pop and one of my personal favourites, Samurai Shampoo. From parody to drama to comedy to sci-fi to romance to adventure, Gintama combines all these sub-genres into one show, giving you that variation that not many other shows has gotten the balls to attempt doing. You can go on all day about the extraordinary lengths Gintama does to get a laugh, varying from penis-shaped cannons to puking or getting your balls crushed or tied, or coming out of a coffin or getting a drill in your arm. But overall, what makes Gintama particularly my favourite shonen are the variations of entertainment they incorporate into each arc, making them enjoyable in any way possible, whether it be through laughter, drama or action. Which is why I love this series to bits, because the show always offers a different setting for each arc to keep the flow of the anime going strong without it feeling dragged. And you can also check out Gintama <laughs> on Crunchyroll.